we want. And then after we change the first 10,000 values, keep everything else defined recursively, right? depending on those earlier values that we've changed. Um, and as long as we're looking for large enough values of n, the two things that we are sort of following throughout this talk, certain residue classes being zero, certain residue classes being non-zero, that's still going to hold for large enough values of n. Um, and in addition, if we were too deregular before we started, we're still going to be too deregular. So um, these properties are fairly robust, right? We can sort of mess with them at the beginning, and they're still going to reassert themselves. Turns out, this is something that's really useful as we start to look at subtracting other numbers. Um, we actually need some of these ideas and this general principle to be able to really understand what happens when we subtract other values. So, moving ahead, looking at uh, subtraction. I want to start just by talking about a special case. Um, this is some data for the case where we subtract 2 and divide by 2. Uh, when it first starts, we don't notice much of a pattern, and it seems fairly scattered, but eventually, pretty quickly, we start getting this repetition. We have these blocks of length 2 uh, that always have the same value. And again, this isn't a fluke about the first 30 terms, this really does continue throughout. And for lack of a better word, I call this stuttering of length k. Um, well, in this case, stuttering of length t. So we start to see this pattern. Um, at this point, it's a little bit mysterious where this comes from, right? why this begins when it begins. Um, but by looking at the digraph, we can see that once it happens once, it's going to continue. And you can see this block 2k and 2k minus 1. Well, if 2k minus 2 and 2k minus 3 have the same Sprague-Rendi value, and k just has a single Sprague-Rendi value, Right, then 2k and 2k minus 1, their Sprague-Rendi values are going to be max over identical sets. Right, so they're, if 2k minus 2 and 2k minus 3 have the same value, 2k and 2k minus 1 are going to have to have the same value. Right, and you can sort of keep going. So this is sort of like giving you the inductive step without giving you the base case. Right? Once it happens once, once there's a single block where it occurs that these two things have the same value, it's going to persist. And we can make this argument uh, more in general, right? it really depends on these two facts, that you have a block, and if you look at what it depends on under subtraction, it's values from a single block. Right? And every block that you're looking at depends on the same value under division. And as long as those two things are going to be true, we're going to have the same sort of inductive step argument. And that's going to happen exactly for blocks of length uh, GCD of A and B. Of course, GCD of 2 and 2 is 2. Fine, we get stuttering in length 2. All right. So let's look now at the case of subtract 4 divided by 2. Um, very quickly, we see it starts to fall into this pattern of stuttering of length 4. Okay, all of a sudden, we get blocks of length 4. This is more than we would have expected. Right? Just from what we've looked at before with this GCD argument, we would have expected blocks of length 2. Now, all of a sudden, we're getting blocks of length 4. And the question is sort of, where is this coming from? So here I have written out the, the diagraph for this game. It's actually kind of big enough that I had to write it sideways, right? but it's still the same, same idea. And we expect stuttering of length 2. So eventually, far enough out in the sequence, we're going to have everything in terms of blocks of length 2. All of those sort of pairs that I have circled in red here are going to have the same value. And so at this point, it sort of stops making sense to think about it just in terms of individual elements, where individual elements depend. And we can just look at where the values sort of in a single block depend. Because right? far enough out, large enough n, everything is really paired up this way. So I'm going to get rid of some of the arrows here, clean this up a little bit. And we maybe recognize this. If you don't recognize it, I'll tell you. This is the same diagraph that we actually had for subtract 2, divide by 2. Right? If we look at just what's happening to the blocks, right, individually, each element is still subtracting 4. Right? But if we look at a block, it doesn't depend on the one that's sort of like 1 less than it, sort of 1 block less than it. It depends on the block that's 2 down from it. So within the blocks, it's behaving like we're subtracting 2, as well as still dividing by 2. Right? We still have that. So 
So as we start to get this stuttering, it's having the effect of reducing the number that we're subtracting by. Of course, we know that in the game subtract 2 divided by 2, we still expect stuttering of length 2, which means that if I'm keeping track of what values each block has, I eventually start to see stuttering, or I'd expect to start to see stuttering in the blocks themselves, right? Eventually I'd expect this block to have the same value as that block, and this block to have the same value as that block. And so eventually that's where I'm going to get the stuttering of length 4. Um, and in general, this has the potential to continue and continue and continue, right? If we looked at subtract 32 divided by 2, right? And we actually looked at a big stretch of the data. It's a little too much to put on the screen comfortably. Um, but you would actually be able to see it happen a lot more slowly. Right? First, all of the pairs would line up. Then all of the blocks of 4 would line up. Then all of the blocks of 8. At this point, you have to go way far down in sequence. Eventually, all the blocks of 16. And then finally, all the blocks of 32. So this kind of repeated, this kind of nesting um, continues. And again, here it is sort of in general. Right? This isn't something special about subtracting by 2. As long as we keep getting these um, GCDs between what we're subtracting by and what we're dividing by, we're going to keep having this behavior. We're going to keep being able to reduce what we're subtracting by. Um, since we have a little bit of time, um, let's look at this claim for a minute. I said it's before it was sort of like I gave you the inductive part of the proof um, and not the base case. Right? We really, all I've really justified to you guys so far is that um, stut once stuttering occurs once, it's going to continue. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this important base case that stuttering really is inevitable. So I'm going to jump to my sort of secret cache of extra slides at the end. Um, I want to talk about how you would actually go about proving this kind of base case. So the idea behind it is that we're going to make a different diagram that's going to somehow encode all of the possible ways we could get from one block to another block. Right? Even if we don't have stuttering, we still have the sense that our blocks, the way they've set, we've set them up, each block depends on a single value under division and a single other block under subtraction. Right? So we still have this structure. We can make a directed graph and sort of see what's going on. That's our main idea. Here I can tell you exactly what this digraph is going to be made of. I'm going to define the vertices to be these triples, x, y, and z. These are all going to be Sprague Grundy values. So x, y, and z are only going to be uh, in the set 0, 1, and 2. Right? x and y are going to be um, values in the block, Sprague Grundy values. Um, this is sort of where we're going to see, are we getting the stuttering? Are x and y the same, or are they different? Uh, and it turns out, this wasn't immediately obvious to me, but it turns out we actually also want to keep track of what things are depending on under division. So you also want to have this third term, z, kind of hanging along. And from there, we're able to put in these edges. Right? Knowing x, knowing y, and knowing z, we can get to three other triples. Right? The next block is going to be, well, the first term is going to be the max of x and z, and the second term is going to be the max of y and z, because it depends on x and y via subtraction, z via division. Um, and then in this digraph, uh, I'm sort of saying that we don't have any control over sort of what's going on in a different part of the sequence, right? Whatever, whatever Z was, it had something that came sort of before or after it, may or may not be related to what's going on there. There's still a fairly limited number of vertices and edges. And one of the neat things about this graph, by the way, is that it's fairly small, right? I'm looking at triples in 0, 1, 2. So I only have 27 vertices. Right? So you really can kind of look at this thing, uh, write it all down, get a sense of it. What we'd like to show is that any walk in this digraph is going to eventually get to a point where x and y have the same value. And that corresponds to any kind of initial prefix in this, in this sequence, any set of blocks eventually getting to a place where stuttering occurs. We know that if stuttering has, occurs, it persists. So it's basically mm. pigeonhole. Pigeonhole. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, so, so essentially, the sequence is going to be an infinite walk, right? And we'd really just like to say that it's, yeah, it's going to get somewhere, somewhere that's good. Um, there is this one problem, though. If I were going to design a proof to, to do this, I would set aside and say, OK, well, let's just show that there aren't any directed cycles that stay in these sort of bad elements, right, where the first two are non-equal. Um, 
And in fact, that isn't true. Right? There are these directed cycles where the first two elements are non-equal. And so in theory, you could imagine sort of getting stuck in one of these directed cycles and just going around and around and around, taking this infinite walk. Where does stuttering come from? Um, and it turns out it's um, not too hard to see once you sort of really look at it and once you have the idea to really keep track of z as well as x and y. Um, all of these bad directed cycles have the same values for z. Right? In, in any one of these directed cycles, either z is always 0 or z is always non-zero. And so if we really stayed in one of these bad directed cycles, that would correspond to somewhere else in the sequence we're tracing out something that's all zeros or all non-zero terms. Um, and we can actually show that that can't happen. Um, of course, it seems a little bit suspicious, right? Of course, we've already looked at residue classes that are all zero or all non-zero. But these are going to be much smaller than residue classes. Right? It's sort of a very um, not sparse subsequence. I don't know what the opposite of sparse is. Um, and so we really can show that um, this is going to create a problem for us in the z-coordinate. From there, we can show that we can break out of any of these pad cycles. So we really are going to be OK. There's some interesting things going on here. Okay, so hopefully at this point you believe me that stuttering not only is likely to happen, but actually really is inevitable. That whenever we have A and D, A and 2D here, or A and B as I have it written, um, having some common factors, we really are going to see this stuttering eventually. Um, this moreover statement is saying that we really are going to have this nested stuttering, right? Once we see stuttering of length g, then we really are going to reduce the amount that we're subtracting by. If we still have common factors, then we're still going to get more stuttering. So the way to write this down is we sort of jump straight to the chase. Right? We're going to say a prime is going to be the largest divisor of a that's relatively prime to b. Um, we know that we expect to start seeing blocks of length a over a prime that are all have the same value. And at that point, the digraph is really going to be arranged like the game a prime b n. So we're really going to have reduced from subtracting a to subtracting a prime as we look at these different blocks. And now we see the benefit of having looked at this Mazer game. If we want to start understanding the sequence of uh, a prime b n, this is the sort of the sequence of values that the blocks take. Um, that's going to be um, sorry. If we want to start understanding the sequence of values that the blocks take. Right, which is um, looking at the every a over a prime term, it's going to be just like subtracting a prime divided by b, except that this behavior took a while to actually appear. Right? So we have this potentially kind of long string at the beginning that doesn't follow our rules. Right? So we've really kind of arbitrarily changed a whole bunch of initial values. But for the patterns that we care about, that probably isn't a problem. If a prime is 1 and b is even, then when we do this reduction, we get back into the case where we're looking at subtracting 1 dividing by an even number, all of the things that we cared about still hold. We still have the fact that certain residue classes are all 0 or non-zero, and we still have that the series is automatic. So these results that sort of seemed very specific, just to subtract 1 and divide by 2, actually hold for a pretty wide class. Final little summary. Um, this is what we had initially. I've written it kind of in this funny way so that we can generalize it. Uh, if we move to subtracting an arbitrary even number, uh, instead of just having those two terms in each of those, uh, we now have this long sort of alternating block. We keep this automatic. And finally, if we move to, in addition, subtracting a, we get this long alternating block that's made up of these uh, repeated pieces. And there is this caveat that this only really starts to take effect for large values of n. Okay. That's all I have. You have time for questions? Yeah. Um, you have this structure that holds eventually when n's big enough, you know, it, it reduces. Are you able to use, like, so maybe the recurrences that you had earlier and then the structure that, that directed graph, the last one you constructed, to, to get a handle on 
when it's gonna? Yeah, yeah. So um, every time, so, so for subtracting A and dividing up by 2D, um, every time we do this reduction, right, every time that we start to get sort of blocks of length GCD and then we sort of, it settles down into that for a while and then we're gonna see more, we're gonna have to go um, about 2D times further. Right, so in this case, when I talked about when we're subtracting 32 and dividing by 2, right, first, first we see the pairs start to line up. Then twice as far out as that, plus a little bit extra, we're going to start to see the groups of, of 4. And then twice as far and a little bit more, we're going to start to see groups of 8. Um, so it really could potentially be a long sequence. Right? It really could take a while, um, particularly if we're dividing by a large number. Um, but it's... Yeah, it's going to be kind of roughly exponential with a little bit of this extra stuff. And it's going to be in terms of how many, um, how many factors we're going to be pulling out of A. Right? How many times we're going to have to go through that process. So you had a lot of experimentations to arrive at your beautiful mm -hmm. results. But yes. at the end, are the proofs human generated or um, also computer generated? The, pro yeah, the proofs are human generated. So it would be a nice challenge to teach the computer. I could probably yeah, so, so some of the proofs, um, the proofs of those recurrences are actually not, um, as they are currently written, they're actually not induction proofs. Um, but, but they are sort of, um, you, you sort of go out to a finite depth in the digraph and you start like aggregating some of these results, sort of saying which terms are going to actually be equal. Um, so, so it could be possible. Um, yeah, it would be a little different. Also, can you generalize it when you have more than 0, 1, and 2 in the values? Um, I have some results for um, looking at subtracting 2 and taking away different powers of 2, like if you can subtract 2 and then also, or, sorry, divide by 2, and then also subtract 1 and 2 and 4. Well, and the degree um, is larger, then you have more. Yeah, right, and that increases the size of the numbers. But I don't have anything sort of unified. I think uh, the, fir the first problem you considered appeared mm -hmm. in American Mathematical Monthly yes. like two months ago. Yes. Okay. Um, sounded really familiar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I know it appeared in the monthly. Um, as far as I know, uh, this Berlecamp and Bueller is like the original one. It's actually slightly different. They, they subtract to you and round up. So it's like a slight variation. Yeah, the monthly plagiarized. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I owe you five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to uh, do something. Um, and then there have also been these two other sort of very recent papers. These look at a slightly different generalization. They look at subtract one, divide by two. Um, and they also look at games where you can divide by t and you can subtract anything up to t. Right? So it's a different way of generalizing subtract one, divide by t. Um, and they have some similar results. Um, at the very least, about sort of which one, you know, when is it, when is it a win, when is it a loss, um, and I believe that the Alan Gould paper starts to go into some of the stuff about um, regularity, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if he sort of quite comes out and says it in, those, in that language. But again, it's a slightly different version of the game. Professor, may I have a question? Yes. Oh. Um, so you are looking for regularities here, but there is this famous. Uh, I don't know the name. 3M plus 1 game, which, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. case, which is kind of chaotic, right? Mm -hmm. well, there's no choice there. What? There's, there's no there. choice between the 3M plus 1 and dividing by 2. Right. No, there's no choice to be. Yeah, yeah, it's in that flavor. Right. Same right. idea. Right. I was thinking of that too, yeah. Now, so what I'm saying is that, okay, call the, that old problem a mess. <laughs> but uh, uh, what you find here is there is a lot of regularity. Mm -hmm. So where is the where where does the regularity becomes a chaos? I mean, <laughs> is there a game where you gave up? You don't want to talk about it. Um, you have nothing to say. Well, so so this is maybe a partial answer. I did also look at the games where you subtract one and divide by an odd no number. And if you notice, they didn't appear here. They sort of very sneakily got left out. Um, there is some structure there, um, but as far as I can tell, I haven't been able to sort of make it precise. Um, rather than getting sort of residue classes that are all zeros, 
you tend to, if you subtract one and divide by three, you tend to get residue classes that are sort of zero for a while, and then up to three times out further, they're all non-zero. And then up to three times out further than that, they're all zero. So you sort of get the same, like, some kind of pattern, mod three, uh, but I don't have sort of like a nice handle on it. And a lot of the proofs that I did here really rely on this fact that you can find certain residue classes that are just always zero, right? So you just know that if you get to that residue class, you're done. Um, so, so I don't, I mean, I don't want to really be on the record that this is the definitive place where, the, where it switches. Um, but I would say already if you start dividing by odd numbers, you get much more of that chaotic feel. I think there is structure there, but... No, what know. I'm seeing is mass is just as interesting as regularity. Especially that people don't dare to deal with it, right. right? So actually, it would be very interesting to collect messy games. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not the same bet.